Security might make you think of airports, terrorism or international security. But security is increasingly practiced locally. Local governments seek to secure squares, streets and other public spaces from loitering youth or crime. In doing so, security practices enter our everyday lives and our communities. They start to shape and reshape the social constitution of urban life and the meaning of urban spaces. Urban governments are responsible for securing our neighborhoods. But governments are not the only practitioners of security. Also citizens perform security. And these performances are often informal and easy to overlook. In my research on urban conflicts, I observed how a well-intended formal security practice had unforeseen consequences for the informal social fabric of a neighborhood. So, what is the relationship between formal and informal security routines? In the old Soviet bloc, a wall prevented inhabitants from leaving their countries. Today's authoritarian regimes typically allow and even encourage their people to travel, work or study abroad. But this new strategy carries risks for them. People may not return. They may foment revolution from abroad. Or they may return with dangerous democratic ideas. Our research group, Authoritarianism in a Global Age, asks, how do authoritarian regimes control their populations abroad? Let's look at this billboard in Jamaica. It's an ad for Marksman, a private security company. Don't these men look like public security forces in their army green uniforms? The tourist sign in front welcomes you to Jamaica, but they warn you that you're actually in marksman territory. Across the world, we see processes of security privatization. In addition to the police, we see uniformed security guards, voluntary neighborhood watches, and even armed vigilantes protecting people's lives and property. These private security providers don't necessarily compete with public security forces such as the police. Often, they collaborate together. They're central to what we call public-private security assemblages. Protecting citizens and maintaining public order have traditionally been seen as core state functions. The monopoly on the legitimate use of violence has been central to definitions of the state. So what does it mean when the state actively shares this monopoly and private security providers take on a public role. Focusing on security assemblages, my research team is looking for new ways to understand transformations in governance and citizenship. States around the world invest massively in the detention and deportation of irregular migrants and unrecognized asylum seekers. These investments are steadily increasing in recent years. At the same time, the so-called success rate of states in managing to deport undesired and illegalized migrants is consistently very low. We can therefore assert that states' deportation regimes are colossally failing to achieve their declared goals. In our project that runs in seven countries, we do not focus so much on changing regulations, policies, or international conventions. We also put aside the perspective of irregular migrants. Instead, we want to understand the practices and motivations of those actors implementing or preventing the process of deportation. The question is, how should we understand the evident discrepancy between the investment in and the results of deportation regimes? 